Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Perez Art Museum Miami. My name is Marie Vickles, and I'm the Director of Education. And wherever in the world you are joining us from, and especially in Miami, thank you. Tonight, we are presenting the online version of our Local Views at PAM program featuring visual artist Rhea Leonard. Local Views features Miami-based artists sharing their practice and discussing work of art on view at the museum that connect in various ways to their own work. Local Views also provides a firsthand interaction with local artists centered on their creative process. This casual 30-minute conversation now takes place every Thursday online at 6 p.m. So in these weeks of quarantine, we have seen many inspiring and engaging programs making their way to virtual spaces allowing us to participate in programs that are both local and international. At the end of tonight's program, I just want to encourage you to, to check out another locally produced arts program presented by Commissioner as creatives convene on COVID-19, discussing the pressures facing artists and what lies ahead. So a little shout out to Commissioner there. Um, all right. Introduce Rhea. I'd also like to very hard to make these programs come together online. Anita Bram, Associate Director of Adult Programs and Audience Engagement, Claire Allen, Digital Marketing Coordinator, and of course, our world-class AV team, Denise Faxis and Andrew Bird. It never gets old saying this, we really couldn't do this without you, so thank you all. Let's get started. Rhea Leonard, born and raised in South Florida, utilizes drawing, printmaking and sculpture within her artistic practice. She explores topics highlighting the Black body and how society affects Black psychology through her detailed and poignant figurative works. By working with visual metaphors and heavy imagery to present these situations from a shifted perspective, she hopes to start a conversation that bridges the gap of understanding using images where words have failed us. Rhea received her MFA from Florida International University and her BFA from University of Florida through New World School of the Arts College. Her work has been featured at Redbridge Studios, the African Heritage Cultural Arts Center, the Art and Culture Center of Hollywood, and the Art Africa Miami Arts Fair. She has participated in the Contemporary Art Program Lab with the Skya Museum and Gardens and was a recipient of the Betty Laird Perry Award. As a result of this award, her work is now part of the permanent collection at the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum. Rhea most recently completed a residency at Anderson Ranch Arts Center in Snowmass, Colorado, via Ulites Art's newest program, Home and Away. Her residency at Anderson Ranch provided the opportunity to build connections with other artists and the international art, art world while also providing time for her to explore new ideas that will further enrich her own practice and Miami's cultural community. Rhea is currently a resident of the Bakehouse Art Complex located right here in Miami, Florida. And as you watch along this evening on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, please post some questions for Rhea. We will try to answer as many as possible in the Q&A portion of this evening's presentation. And remember, if you value this and other programs presented by the museum, please consider supporting us by going to pam.org backslash donate. So all of that said, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rhea. Thank you, Marie, for that warm introduction. Hi, everyone. I'd like to start off by saying thank you to the Perez Art Museum for this opportunity to take part in our Local Views program. Um, I'm not gonna trouble you all. Let's jump right in. I'm gonna get started with our first artwork. Um, to, first off, we're gonna start off with the painting or the paintings by Maleko Magosi, Your Trip to Africa 2020. What intrigues me about this work is the actual setup and the way everything is arranged and looking at the various figures that are depicted. It reminds me of how as an artist, we really do have the power to decide how the viewer will take in what it is we're discussing in our work. And it also brings back my love of how information can be laid out differently through the several languages we have in this world and also the different ways story, storytelling unfolds itself. And I do see myself or see my practice as this very elaborate way 
of telling disparate stories that are sort of inter interconnected, that if I ever had to, I probably could string them together. But storytelling in itself is very important to my practice. Another important thing about this work is the absolute scale of the work. In looking at you looking at this work versus the piece itself, it's massive. And as someone who focuses on the body and how my work relates to the human body focusing on the black body, the scale of my work is important step that I choose, I, I look at when choosing to make my work. And while my drawings are actually on the larger end of the spectrum, my sculptures and printmaking, those are more intimate interactions where it happens on a very close scale with the, the viewer. And I feel that most of my drawings, they're kind of arresting to the viewer at times. And that's not to say I don't want people to get close to my drawings. It's just they have a certain way about them, um, especially when it comes to machinations. I'm sure everyone saw this one in the invitation. It's still kind of like jarring for me to even see. But people tend to walk into my studio and keep their distance from my drawings. And over time, they get a little closer. They First, they take into the composition what I'm actually trying to bring to my figures and what I'm trying to actually tell them. And then they'll actually step a little closer. It's tentative sometimes, and it's really nice to see people not know if they should get closer, but I do encourage people to get closer because there are a lot of details in my drawings that I actually really work the surface of these drawings, front and back of the surface, since it's not on paper. But I do really try to imbue my figures with not just their shading and their depth, but also other things that go on and to put a type of energy into my mark making. Yeah. On to our next piece. We have the artwork by Von Spann, Mark, Mark Mann Mitchell, 2019, a work inspired by the artist um, in the artist's experience with racial profiling. And this work actually brought up the saying or this idea of abstraction from the real where the artist took their experience from the real, from real life and actually dedu well, well, yeah, boiled it down or deduced it into this very simplistic X. I didn't, before I even read about the artist or looked into ex exactly what their work is about, I saw the letter X, but the more I started reading and considering what this represented, I started thinking about how the X or a cross can mean different things in different contexts. And it's, very fascinating how it actually does make you think about the human body in a, in a police pat down, how it really could mimic an X. And I started thinking about how I tend to do a similar thing in my practice where I do ruminate on certain topics when I want to discuss certain things because I won't always go for that initial easy depiction because illustration is not what I want to do. I actually want my figures to not be so familiar or my situations in my work not to be so familiar, but to lure you in to investigate and find out exactly what else is going on. Because there's not all, there's rarely ever one topic going on in my works. And I do encourage my viewers to investigate, to really take time to consider what works, what's going on in the work. And I would say my first stab at that would be pierced. This is actually a printmaking reproduction of a drawing I did in 2016. And 2016, we, a lot of stuff was going on, but I was taking the temperature of the black community from friends and family. And I was seeing the same sentiments over and over. And I wanted a figure that could herald what we were all feeling at the time. So I imbued her with a silent scream, hands tied behind her back, a hint at being bored hollow from her emotions, still dragging along the pain and the trauma because both hands are still they're, they're both preoccupied. There's no time to stop and heal because the struggle continues. And this piece just means so much. I get, I get a little emotional when I look at it again, but yeah. Oh, my favorite piece. Um, I shouldn't have said that, but it's true. I get very excited when I see Kevin Beasley's Untitled Parade because there's something about seeing the human form frozen in space and to walk around it in a way that your body reacts as if there's another person there and you like keep your distance, your personal space, but to walk over and not see the body there, it's referencing the absent body. And that's something I really, really work at in my work, especially in my sculpture and printmaking. Um, something I'm working on um, developing more <laughs> in my work. Um, 
in my sculptural work, I tend to take parts of the human body that have nothing to do with the, a certain other part of the body and then try to have it reference that part, if that makes any sense. But my ongoing, my latest ongoing project that I concluded in 2019 is this teeth bangle. My friends know it because I've been complaining about it forever. But the idea behind this piece was to have the viewer question desire and ownership. And my number one question with this piece is whose teeth are they? Are they mine? And do I know the person? And it's not a question I'm going to answer because it's not really important. But the fact that if I can get my viewers to ask me that, that means that I'm getting you to think about someone else's body even without even having to show it. And that's the most important thing I find that I want to do with my work. That sometimes the topics that I want to reach don't necessarily need the, the black body to be present in order for me to address it. And I find that I kind of got as close as I could possibly get when it came to Kid Conjure. And this is actually a diptych, but this is the first um, image in the diptych. And I, because it has the best details, but it's a depiction of a child-sized sneakers with lived-in details with messages of encouragement and symbols of protection. And without actually showing who the owners are, I would hope that the viewers would investigate a little closer and actually see and question who these shoes belong to and like what type of life does this person lead that they would write these things or do these things to their shoes that are on their feet so like what type of person is this? And I would hope that as the viewer is taking into consideration and thinking about the context of the world we live in, a face might form. And I know for me, I see the faces of the people that we've lost to police brutality. And being able to do, to talk about police brutality in a way without showing the black body, I felt was absolutely important because considering how we live or how America is, where people don't really have a very conscious or self-awareness of how the black bot they consume the black body or black culture. I don't want to add more into that. I don't want to feed that habit. I would much rather give someone a little some a little difficult, something a little difficult to chew on. I'm not going to give it to you straight. Like you're going to have to do a little bit more work if you're trying to understand where my work's coming from. I'm not going to give it to you sugar coated as well. So yeah. And if I can take the challenge of discussing what I need, the, dis the discussing the t the difficult topics of my work, if I can do that without showing the body, that's a that's a challenge I'm going to take more often than not. Ooh, okay. With all that said, I know that was a lot, but um, I'd like to welcome in Anita and get to the questions that you guys have going for me. Can't wait to get to. You guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rhea. Um, that was amazing. I really loved how you wove in your work right alongside a few of the works that we have currently up at the museum. So thank you so much again for that and for joining us. Um, and then I guess I'll start with our first few questions as more are coming in. Um, our first question is from Megan and she'd like to ask, can you tell us more about the materials and methods that you use to make your work? Okay, specific work? like or just in general because I do I don't use paper for my drawings I use a special type of um, transfer paper like it's meant for architecture and it's like a very durable vellum and it allows me to work on both sides and I actually like the transparency of it um, when it comes to sculpture I'm in metal casting it's actually pewter that bracelet that everyone saw um, and for printmaking I, I mainly work in copper plate etchings I mean, I guess this is a side question of my own, but how do you how um, how do you work with pewter? Does it need to be melted down, or how how is it? How do you make it malle malleable? Oh yeah, you have to melt it down. It, but it's a what's beautiful about pewter, and I use a lead-free version, so I can work on it t t relatively safely at home. But it melts on the stovetop. It's not a high temp metal. It's not like gold or silver where it takes special a special type of heating, you know, and you got to like quickly throw it into your casting. It's not like that. It's very, it's kind of forgiving. It's usually a beginner's metal for jewelry makers. And I'm kind of learning from a friend of mine who's teaching me what he knows. So he's like, you don't move on to gold until you can master pewter. And then I kind of just stuck with the pewter because it's so, it's so easy to melt something down and start over if you mess up. And I just love it. Yeah. No, that, that sounds awesome. I had no idea you could melt pewter down. Yes. <laughs> I guess our next question is one from 
Colette Mello, um, and she asked you to please share what you worked on in your recent residency. I think that's something that we all would like to know more about, um, how you dealt with the cold, of course, what you worked on. Could you tell us some more? Um, I spent most of my time at the residency working on printmaking. I have like, I have to go through it. I have to go like, I have like eight plates that are in like various stages of done, but because I'm cut off from my resources at Bakehouse, I can't really work anymore. So I can't really proof to see where I'm at. And that printmaking is very tied to the press. So I really can't do much without it. Um, but I spent most of my time printmaking. I worked on a few drawings and I also started doing, I finished a beading piece, but I didn't finish it there. I finished that when I got home. But I was working on a beading piece and it was like a meditative process, which was really nice. Handling the cold, that, I mean, I studied in Vancouver in my undergrad, so it wasn't my first time seeing snow, but it's been a while. So it was an adjustment, but literally by week three, I was like, yeah, it's fine. I don't need my outer coat. I'm just going to go across the campus real quick and then come right back. I don't need the coat. So it was an adjustment, like, and it was fun being with everyone. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, you guys see the snow? It's so shiny today. It was like being kids and it was so nice. No one was making fun of anyone. So we were all like, we don't get to see this every day. So we're going to marvel as hard as we can. And that's exactly what we did. It's, uh, it sounds like an amazing place to, to work in and focus on your practice. Amazing. Sounds awesome. Shout out to Anderson Ranch. Oh my gosh. It's, their facilities are amazing. If you ever have a chance as an artist to go, I would, I highly recommend it. Nice. Major shout out. Okay. <laughs> we have another question from um, Onika Russell. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted to know whose teeth, whose teeth those are. Those are. I guess I'm not sure if you answered it, but whose teeth are they? It's not a living person. I actually I hand sculpted those. <laughs> They're hand sculpted teeth. They're no one's teeth. So. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank That's you. The question. But don't tell anyone. So if anyone ever asks, just keep keep it between us it's between us it's a special freebie here for everyone here tonight don't tell anyone though i tend to not answer that question but yeah okay i got gotcha. you um and then laura marsh asked can you talk about the poetic texts in your drawings poetic text are we talking about kid conjure oh um i wouldn't say it's more poetic i would say a lot of the sayings for this because I tend to not use writing in my work for reasons, because my handwriting has a certain connotation to it. It's very pretty. So I tend to not like to write in my work. And doing this was actually a nightmare because writing backwards on the plate, I didn't think it was going to be as hard as it was, but it was. Um, but these sayings are not so much poetry, but they're kind of like well wishes. But then I try to like change them so they're not everyday greeting so it makes you stop and think exactly what is being conveyed to the person or what the person meant when writing it and you guys can't see it but in the other diptych there are scriptures written for like yea do i walk through the valley of shadow of death i shall fear no evil i use the actual scripture written on the sneakers in the other thing but i drew inspiration from different religions across the diaspora and different um different cultures in bringing together how we deal with protection and how do we alter the things that we own or our possessions to keep us protected in our day-to-day -day lives and that's what i was looking at yes. thank you um, let's see next question is do you think art has the ability to change and better black people's lives if yes how so how would you like your art to change all people's lives? And tell us more about Anderson Ranch. <laughs> that was, I think, a follow-up to Onika Russell's question. Okay. Um, I absolutely do believe art has the ability to change lives because art changed my life. Like, I tell people all the time, like, I don't think I would have got out of school if I didn't have art. Like, art really helped me remember the things I needed to remember to get the grades so I could be in art class the way I was and to actually spend time on my still life because I had the grades to be in math class. It's like, okay, you don't need to be here. You can go spend time and work on your project over here. And I do believe art has the ability to change people's lives, especially black people's lives, because I don't think we see ourselves enough in the conversation regarding contemporary art. And I mean, we are representing, there are artists out there working, but I feel like there's, it could be so much more. There, there's so many different stories, different perspectives that, aren't told and aren't magnified. And I feel like there's still room 
for more of us to have that attention shed on the way we live and what our situation is like. And what was the other part of the question? Oh, how would I like my art to change people's lives overall? Honestly, I feel like contemporary art, and I said this recently, but I feel like contemporary art is the mirror to which society should look at itself and have the opportunity to either better or rise above what it's going through because it's literally taking a temperature of what we see as our artists are. We are living and showing what exactly what we're seeing. And if society, if you're not looking at what your artists are doing, you're missing out on a chance to actually look at yourself in a real unfettered light and look at it from different perspectives. Everyone's not going to see the same things, but if you're looking at what your contemporary artists are doing, that's a chance to better yourself. That means if you're seeing minorities, you're seeing poor people, if you're seeing people of different, um, I don't want to mess this up, but if you're seeing people who are underrepresented and you're not taking into account, you're not actually trying to better the situations for them, then I feel like that's a pitfall. Art's a boon for society. And if art, if society's not taking that hint, I mean, I mean, what are you doing really? Um, and about Anderson Ranch, I mean, what else to talk about? I mean, I, there's certain things like it's magical. It was really great. And I mean, I got a chance to learn from artists in different stages of their career as an, I consider, as an emerging artist. I got to see different ways that artists go about handling different parts of the business, how they go about their studio practices. Um, I borrowed from several artists on how they do their work. And I surely am still working with those, those tasks, those little abilities that I learned. It's amazing. We're all still have our little group chat and we're all talking to each other. Shout out everybody. Um, we're here this year. Um, but yeah, and I've taken some time to look back and think about what an opportunity Anderson Ranch was to really just slow down and look at where I'm at in my career. And even now, having this opportunity to be here with the Perez Art Museum, this is big. And everyone did not spare the chance to let me know how big this was. And it's psyching me out. But to really just take time and to be thankful for the opportunities and the people that I've met who believe in what I do and to actually give me the chance and the platform to speak. So it's just been amazing. Yeah, sobering. Well Got to love the the hype crew, of course. Yes, yeah, it's really interesting to to share a space and in such a remote place um, with so many fellow artists. I think that's why everybody's so so into it and so intrigued. Um, the next question we have is from William Valdez, and he asked, "What did you do post undergrad?" I took a year off. I didn't go straight into grad school, and I, I will honestly say that was the hardest year. That was like the first time I got rejected from like a program. I was questioning my abilities, if art was a thing I should do, if I should just hang it up and just go, because I'm really good at science. So I was thinking, should I just switch gears and go to a different like study? But I, I took some time off and I applied myself. I actually worked and revamped my work and actually took time to look at what I was doing in undergrad and realize that it wasn't actually what I wanted, I mean, I had gotten the work to a certain extent, like a certain point, but it wasn't actually, I wasn't actually connected to it the way I am now with my work. And I remodeled it in a way, I guess. And I think that's what Brad Program saw. They saw that I was making work, but it wasn't like I was really passionate about it. And it's hard, It's hard. I mean, it's fine now, but I was kind of taking it personal, but it's it was a necessary step because I don't think I would have got through grad school if I hadn't taken that year off because I really, standing on my own two legs and it's like, okay, no, you're going to do this. You're going to sit down and everything you've learned, reapply it to the work you're making, be as honest as you can when you don't have your whole class with you and you can't critique with anyone. You have to be as honest as you can and then make the work evolve. Yeah. Love that. Um, I guess as a side note question, what kind of science are you into? Uh, um, what was it? I've forgotten. <laughs> Um, I was really into chemistry. Like I like chemicals and mixing things like the nomenclature of like, like that was my thing in high school. Like it was the hardest thing to learn. But once I learned nomenclature and like the moving of molecules and all that, that was my thing. So I was probably going to go into chemistry. Yeah. 
Very cool. You can tell almost from like, there's like an anatomy type feel uh, to oh. some of your drawings that I really oh. admire. Um, okay, the next question I think was submitted by Dennis Camerata um, mm -hmm. for Marcella Camerata, who is 10 years old. And she asked what your favorite piece of artwork uh, you have completed is. Oh, wow, my favorite. Mm -hmm. My favorite would have to be, um, what is it called? It's, it's a crown of mandibles. I, it's kind of morbid, I, I, it's a 10 year old. But it's a crown of mandibles. It was, I think it was my first major pewter piece. And it started off as a drawing that I wanted. And I was like, if I ever had, it's one of those pieces where if you had no budget and you could do whatever you want, what would you make? And that was the piece I wanted. And I created it while I was at, in my MFA program. And I actually fabricated three mandibles out of pewter. It was an ambitious project for someone who didn't know, really know how pewter worked, but I did it. And then I welded them together. And it's like, I, I melt down a lot of stuff I make, but I never melted down the original three and they're still together in my studio. And that's my favorite piece because I remember laying in the floor drawing. It's like, I don't really want this to be a drawing. I want this to be something I can hold. And the day it came together, it's just, it's my baby. <laughs> it's my baby. Very nice. Well, we look forward to seeing it. Um, Let's see. Actually, we have an update to Onika's question, which was okay. um, about the teeth. Do you mm -hmm. want people to think about wearing the teeth pewter pieces? And is that a part of the desire uh, that you want the work to evoke? Yes, there's two versions of that. The one that I've shown is actually meant to not be worn. It's just meant to be a display piece, but I've actually crafted a lighter version because these are very hard to slip on your wrist and they're very heavy. They really wear out your wrist very quickly, but there's a version that's much lighter and it's meant to be worn and it's more of a fashion thing, but I didn't make that many of them. There's literally only two in existence right now. And I kind of played with the idea and I still don't know how I feel about people walking around with human teeth and what does that mean versus the original idea of the project. But yeah. I mean, I, the original idea was to have it being worn, but then as I got, as I interrogated myself and really kept going through the different stages of the prototypes, it was just like, I don't really think this is appropriate for people to really wear. So I, I don't know, I'm still up in the air about that, but there are two versions of that bracelet, yeah. Right, okay, thank you. Um, Chris Friday asked, how does beading play a part in your practice? Beading, beading's actually, I want to say it's new, but I actually, it was in a piece that I had in my MFA show. That was a very simplistic way of doing it. I think now looking at the, what the beating has become and working with very small pieces, it's a test of my patience because I'm not a patient person, even as detailed as my work is sometimes. It's another level to work with very, very tiny beads, glass beads at that. But it's... I think I, I take it as a similar a shout out to my African roots. And I know on the West Coast, beading is a very treasured, um, a treasured aspect of the culture. And I like to bring that in because I do feel like my work is like a love letter or a love homage to my ancestors because without them, I wouldn't be here. So I feel like every time I'm sitting down beading, it's I don't know, like just a little, give me time to be quiet and just like really med be meditative in what I'm doing. And it's not something as foreign as holding a pencil. I think beading is more, na I guess, natural to me because it feels like doing my own hair. It's like a very repetitive thing and you, my hands are very used to doing that. And it's a comforting thing, I would say. Yeah. I hope well, I answered the question. No, no, I think that's great. It almost seems like the, some of the therapeutic uh, stuff that we might need right now. <laughs> yes, I'm doing a lot of beading right now. Nice. It's a cope. <laughs> nice. A good coping mechanism. Yes. Um, M I N A asked, how uh, does the teeth bangle relate to the teeth crown? It's an offshoot. The crown came first, and then I was thinking, because a lot of people, when they saw the crown originally, they're like, oh, I want to wear it. I want to wear it. And it's like, no, don't, no. It's like, teeth in my work have a connection to speech and voice. And as someone, I say this all the time, but as someone who struggles with speaking and being heard, like the oral, in, 
the oral traditions that happen in the African community, it's an important thing. So it's funny that I, sh I struggle with speaking. So this idea of talking in teeth, it's just, it's become this convoluted thing that I, I keep coming back to and I don't think I quite have gotten it out of my system yet, but the teeth are just an offshoot because I wasn't quite done with the crown and I was like, okay, people want to wear something, what can I do? So it's like, it's a weird little progression to go from a crown of human mandibles to like a bracelet of teeth. I got that. And I don't think that you're bad at speaking whatsoever. I think that's false. I have to negate that that part of the statement. <laughs> People say that, but I, I, it's it's something I work at. I really do work at it. You're doing great. We got a few more questions to get through. Okay. Um, Keep it going. I'm Gary, ready. Gary Martinitis asked, is our coronavirus era inspiring any new art ideas for you? Actually, quite the opposite. Like when I got back from Anderson Ranch, I was super excited to get to my studio to like ex off exchange work and I haven't been able to get back in there. So I'm kind of like, I don't want to say sad, but I'm kind of like, uh, like I feel like I need to recharge in my space, my, my creative space. And I haven't been able to go back there, even though I do have a setup here at my house, but it's quite the opposite. It's kind of like I'm feeling like I'm still not quite returned from Anderson Ranch. I'm still at a residency where I can't go out and do day-to-day -day things. I'm quarantined in my house to do work all the time. And it's like, I don't want to do that today. Yeah, so it feels like we're all in this weird quarantine residency. And I re side note, I really miss Bakehouse as well. So shout out to Bakehouse. We can't wait to get back in those doors. <laughs> yes, <laughs> doors. yes. Um, Let's see, the next question is from Megan and she asked, has your creativity, or you might've just answered part of this, has your creativity and creative output changed during isolation? Do you have what you need to be inspired? I guess you just spoke on a part of that, but. Um, I actually returned from Anderson Ranch with a few pieces and they were purposely complicated for a reason. And I had gone there to make my work evolve and I think I did that, but coming home and actually applying the drawings to their actual scales that I had imagined, it's m much more than I had, it's much more than I anticipated. I'm actually to my gills, like I'm inspired. It's just, I don't want to he rush headlong, like head first into it and then mess up the work because I've already invested X amount of hours into each one. I'm kind of like taking a deep breath, slowing down and just walking by it, keeping it in my space, but I'm not, rushing to do work like work is going to be there and it's still going to be there but at the same time because i'm still at home i'm keeping an, a mind to watch my mental health to like get outside to not always be inside and art is a very indoor thing so i'm always wanting to be outside so it's a balance of stuff so i'm, I'm not hurting for inspiration right now like it's right. it's fine it's just there are, there are other things that are kind of screaming for my attention right now but i do take days where i do plan things work on things and, yeah. i get that yeah still have to be mindful of the process and get outdoors that's what we all need yes <laughs> yes fresh air is your friend it is <laughs> it is um chris friday asked will we ever get to see the beaded work that you made at anderson ranch people really want this beaded work <laughs> my goodness um yes i actually just finished casting the pewter pieces that go with that beaded rope that I did, but I have to attach them. And it's kind of like, I need the studio space because it's very large. I didn't realize how large it was gonna be. And I don't really wanna uh, assemble it in my house because I don't think I'll be able to like photograph it properly, but the pieces are coming together slowly but surely. And I'm also working on a beaded veil and I'm working on that piece by piece. And soon, soon. So the new work's coming, the new series is coming. It's just, it's a little hard to get in your hands on certain supplies because you can't really go anywhere. And it's like stores that I need to be at, I can't really be there. So, well, yes, yeah. the work is coming soon. I totally get that. And um, there's lots of additional messages in the chat um, about uh, missing you, missing you at Bakehouse. Shout outs Aww. from the Anderson Ray. Oh, <laughs> Lots of shout outs. And then I think we have just one more question. We'll end with this one. Um, what do you think about the navigation of commerce and how your focus on the subject of the black body can become twisted into something else 
as your artwork becomes more sought after by collectors and museums? I worry about that a lot. I really do. And it's real when people are interested in buying my work, it's always like an arresting feeling. And I do have to keep in mind, I think that's why I make so much work. It's you I tend to spend a lot of time with my drawings that I have that I'm like that artist, like I don't want to let them go. They're my babies and I no one can have them. But I'm also very conscious of who wants to buy my work because I feel that if you're going to buy my work, I do want you to be very conscious of what it is you're buying. This is not, and if you buy certain pieces, I'm also skeptical because it's like, do you really want to live with this every day? It's like, it's not something very, certain ones are very hard to look at even for me. Like they won't stay up very long in the studio. They'll get rolled up and it's like, okay, I know where it is, but I can't visually look at it because it's also, my work takes a toll on me as well, psychologically. And I... I mean, I can't really be responsible for how other people twist my work, but I can be responsible for what I allow to enter the market and what I do allow to be sold and what I don't allow to be sold. And I really think that's why my prints relate to what I do in my drawings, but they are not the same because I'm not as connected to that. And I think because prints can be reproduced, I don't have qualms with additions, but there's also a certain way, certain thing that... I guess with Pierce, it's hard to explain this, but certain things can't be prints to me because I feel like it's making the black body, it's making it, like you were saying, like it's meant to be something cheapened when it's reproduced over and over and over again. And I don't want it to be some type of currency or some type of um, collectible. That's not what I want, I'm in the business to do because that's not what I want my work to do. I want my work to actually bring light to what I and myself and other black in the black community is going through. And it's, I really can't be responsible for what, how other people do it, but I can be, uh, I'll say it again, I can only be responsible for what I allow to enter the market. And I will say this, I, there are certain things that are not for sale. And until I guess until I get to a certain spot or a point where the work can do other things or I can get better at discussing work without the black body in there and make, and I can be more comfortable, that's where we can go from there. That makes sense. I think, I think it's, it's amazing that you've already identified that and that you have that distinct line in your practice. I yeah. really admire it. <laughs> I think it's smart. Um, I think we'll end it there. Thank you so much for your time. Another virtual, huge virtual round of applause. Imagine many more hands. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Rhea. That was an amazing, uh, amazing talk. It was so great connecting with you and our thank audience. You. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to everybody out there. And uh, just one more reminder, if you're able to donate anything at all so that Pam can continue to support uh, Miami's artists, please consider making a donation at pam.org backslash donate. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, Rhea. Bye.